On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. The man arrested for his murder was Lee Harvey Oswald. But before Oswald could be tried, he also fell victim to an assassin's bullet. And so there never was a trial for the crime of the century. Until now. Showtime British on trial, Lee Harvey Oswald. Did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President Kennedy? You'll examine all the evidence as a real judge, a jury of Dallas citizens, and prominent attorneys who cross-examine actual witnesses conduct the trial that was prevented 23 years ago. The person I chased and from the grassy knoll is one to kill the president of the United States. Oswald did not kill the president. Lee, in, a, in one of his uh, statements to the press, screamed out, I am a patsy. Do you believe he was a patsy? Yes, sir. Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Guilty or innocent, you be the judge. On trial, Lee Harvey Oswald. This is Dallas, Texas. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated here in Dealey Plaza. Hello, I'm Edwin Newman. It was 12.30 p.m. President Kennedy was on his first official visit to Texas. The streets of the city were jammed, but Dealey Plaza was near the end of the president's route, and fewer people had gathered to watch. The motorcade came down Main Street, turned right onto Houston, and then sharp left onto Elm Street. Seconds later, Mr. Kennedy was fatally wounded by gunfire. All the shots were fired from the sixth floor of this building on the corner, the Texas School Book Depository, by a man called Lee Harvey Oswald. That is, according to the official inquiry, many eyewitnesses were convinced that the fatal shots came from this area front and to the right of the motorcade, known as the Grassy Knoll. That November morning, when Dallas was to witness the most notorious murder in modern American history, President Kennedy had had an unusually warm welcome. As the motorcade entered Dealey Plaza, Nellie Connolly, wife of the governor of Texas, turned to the president and said, Mr. Kennedy, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Moments later, the youngest president in American history was gunned down. The president's car had just turned onto Elm Street. Shots rang out. Kennedy was hit. He was rushed to nearby Parkland Hospital. Thirty minutes later came the announcement. The president of the United States is dead. A wave of shock and grief swept much of the world. In a few seconds, the man many believed to be the best hope of his generation was gone. That same day, an employee of the Texas School Book Depository, Lee Harvey Oswald, was arrested following the killing of police patrolman J.D. Tippett. Later, at the Dallas Police Department, he was also charged with the assassination of the president. Oswald was a former Marine and defector to the Soviet Union. When he returned to the United States with a Russian wife, he publicly professed support for Fidel Castro. He advocated restoration of diplomatic, trade, and tourist relations with Cuba. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Within 48 hours of Kennedy's death, Oswald was himself dead. Shot in the basement of the Dallas Police Department by Jack Rooney, a local nightclub owner. The Warren Commission, headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren, was appointed by the new president, Lyndon Johnson, to investigate the assassination. It concluded that Oswald and Oswald alone shot the president. There was no conspiracy. But doubts remained. And in the mid-1970s, a new investigation by a House of Representatives Select Committee reached a more ambiguous conclusion. Oswald was guilty, but there was a high probability of another gunman in Dealey Plaza. And what of Lee Harvey Oswald? 
He claimed to be innocent, a fall guy, to use his own words, just a patsy. In the eyes of the American government, he is condemned as President Kennedy's killer. Yet in his own violent death, Oswald was denied the fundamental right of every American, the right to legal representation and a fair trial. At the same time, the American people were denied the right to see justice done in the crime of the century. This program tries to restore those rights. The trial you are about to see will be as close as possible to a real trial. There is no script, there has been no rehearsal. The judge is a real judge, the lawyers are lawyers, and the witnesses are all genuine. No actor will be playing Lee Harvey Oswald. The defendant's chair is empty. Prosecuting Lee Harvey Oswald is Vincent Bugliosi of Los Angeles. Mr. Bugliosi achieved national prominence when he successfully prosecuted mass murderer Charles Manson. In his career, Vincent Bugliosi has tried 106 felony jury cases and lost only one. Lee Harvey Oswald's defense counsel is Jerry Spence of Jackson, Wyoming. Mr. Spence has not lost a case before a jury for 17 years and has made legal history with a series of victories against large corporations. He became nationally prominent when he won $10 million for the family of nuclear worker Karen Silkwood, who later became the subject of an award-winning film. The jury is made up of citizens of Dallas, Texas, drawn from the official court rules. Their verdict will be revealed at the close of the program. While they are reaching their decision, we will be conducting a live telephone poll to let you at home pass judgment on whether Lee Harvey Oswald is guilty or not guilty. Please rise. Presiding is Judge Lucius Bunton of the Western District of Texas. Judge Bunton has been on the federal bench since 1979 and is a former Texas District Attorney. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, if you would, please call this next case for announcements. The United States of America versus Lee Harvey Oswald. Prosecution ready? Yes, sir. Defendant ready? Defendant's ready, Your Honor. Let me explain just uh, a little bit about how we'll proceed uh, during the course of this uh, proceeding. First, we'll have opening statements. Uh, first by the government, since the burden is on the United States government to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Since they have that burden, they have the opportunity to go first uh, with an opening statement. Then an opening statement will be made by Mr. Spence. Uh, these opening statements are not evidence. Evidence you're going to get from the witness stand or from exhibits that come in during the course of the trial uh, or from stipulations. That's why the attorneys agree uh, that something uh, is a fact. That's the evidence, and it's from those facts, that evidence, that you will determine whether the defendant is guilty uh, or not guilty. So we notice you may proceed, sir. Mr. Spence, Judge Butler, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't have to tell you that you've been called upon to sit as the jury on perhaps the most important murder case ever tried in this country. In any political assassination, ladies and gentlemen, almost as inevitably as death and taxes, there's always a chorus of critics screaming the word conspiracy before the fatal bullet has even come to rest. The evidence that will be presented at this trial will show that there is no substance to the persistent charge by these critics that Lee Harvey Oswald was just a patsy set up to take the fall by some uh, elaborate conspiracy. We expect the evidence, all of the evidence, to show that Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We expect the defense, in an anemic effort to deflect suspicion away from Mr. Oswald, to offer theories, speculation, conjecture, but not one speck of credible evidence that any other person or group murdered President Kennedy and framed Lee Harvey Oswald for the murder that they committed. As this trial unfolds, you will see how utterly preposterous the allegation of a frame-up is. The evidence of this trial will produce a, a, a vivid and a rather stark psychological portrait of Oswald as a deeply disturbed and maladjusted man. 
It will show him to be a fanatical Marxist who restlessly searched for a country to embody the Marxist dream. The evidence will show that on the morning of the assassination, November the 22nd, 1963, Oswald carried his weapon, a 6.5 millimeter Mannlicher Cartano rifle, into his place of employment at the Texas School Book Depository Building. The presidential motorcade was scheduled to pass right in front of that building at very noon. At 12.30 p.m., as the president's limousine drove slowly by, three shots rang out from the southeasternmost window on the sixth floor of that building, one of which penetrated President Kennedy's upper right back, exited the front of his throat, another entering the right rear of his head and exiting and shattering the right frontal area of his head. As the presidential limousine screeched away to Parkland Memorial Hospital, where he was pronounced dead, the president, his life blood gushing from his body, lay mortally wounded in his wife Jacqueline's lap. Within minutes of the assassination, Oswald's rifle was found on the same sixth floor, the floor from which Oswald had brutally cut down at the age of only 46, the 35th president of these United States. The evidence will show that Oswald's rifle, to the exclusion of all other weapons, was determined by firearms experts to be the rifle that fired the two bullets that struck down President Kennedy. The evidence will further show that just 45 minutes after the assassination, Oswald, in frantic flight from what he had just done, shot and killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, running from the scene of the murder to a theater where he was arrested and subdued after drawing his revolver on one of the arresting officers. Much more evidence, ladies and gentlemen, much more will be produced at this trial, irresistibly connecting Oswald and no other person or group to the assassination. I have every confidence that after you folks fairly and objectively evaluate all of the evidence in this case, you will find that Lee Harvey Oswald, and Lee Harvey Oswald alone, was responsible for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Liliosi. Mr. Spence? Thank you, Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For 20 years now, we have all been told that my client, Lee Harvey Oswald, killed our beloved president. And Mr. Buviosi knows that that's what you think, that that's what we think, that that's what even I thought when I began the preparation of the defense of this case. And so I want to take a little more time than he to evaluate the history that's occurred over all of these years to determine whether or not, in fact, you haven't been carrying with you a national lie. And whether or not in this case you don't want to undo by your verdict a national lie. Now one thing, folks, that we know is that uh, it, it, you've watched him do it already. You watched him walk up here and, and tell you that Lee was a commie, and we hate commies. And he's told you that Lee um, was a madman, and we hate madmen. And so what he has done is, is to look at you and say, this isn't a fair jury at all. This is a jury full of prejudice and hatred and passion that I can work with and work on. And so I will make this jury hate Lee Harvey Oswald before he ever had a trial. You understand, of course, in this case, that my client, Lee Harvey Oswald, never had an opportunity to come before you and to speak to you and to look at you and to have you look at him. My client, Lee Harvey Oswald, was slain by a, an assassin's bullet. He was silent so that he could never tell you the truth. And now it's my job somehow 
to try to find some way to bring some parts of the truth to you. Not all of the truth, because as we discover before this case is over, the truth in this case has been concealed from us. And before it's over, you'll need to turn to Mr. Bugliosi and ask him, why haven't you, even now, even these 20 years later, why haven't you, Mr. Bugliosi, who represents the United States of America, who represents the CIA and the FBI, and, uh, and the Army Intelligence, and the Secret Service, who represents this huge plethora of power in this country. Why haven't you even now come forward with the whole truth? It's like there is a closet over here, and the closet door is locked, and we don't know what's in the closet door. And they say to us, Tell us, in your defense of Leo Harvey Oswald, what is in the closet. And I say, open up the closet door so we can, so we can give it to the jury, and you will find. But when this case is concluded, the door will still be locked. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to find out in this assassination, we're going to find in this assassination that the key information that we need for making any kind of, of decision is gone. You heard Mr. Mr. Bugliosi come up and tell you where the shots were fired from. That's in dispute. There's hardly anybody in the country that doesn't dispute it will find out that there is only one way, ladies and gentlemen, that you can ever determine where the bullet came from. Did it come from back or the front? Mr. Bugliosi wants to make sure that it came from the back because if it came from the back, he can claim that it was Lee. But if there is evidence that it came from the front, it was somebody else. When this case is over, ladies and gentlemen, you go back to the jury room, and there will be one verdict, unfortunately, that you can return. And that is a verdict that says we don't know. We just don't know. We wish we did know. We wish the closet door were unlocked. And because we don't know, because they won't unlock the closet, because they have been unfair, because they have secreted and hidden the truth from us. We have only one, one choice. And that's to say that the government still, after 20 years, has refused to come forward with the facts in this sad case about our great president and that you therefore as honest jurors must return a verdict of not guilty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spence. Mr. Bugliosi, call your first witness. Mm -hmm. Government call Leo you. Frazier. Come on, do what, please, sir? You, if you come forward, raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you will give in the proceedings before this court to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Thanks. Seek with the stand, please. Be seated. Mr. Frazier, do you reside here in Dallas? Yes. Directing your attention way back to October of 1963, where you employed at the Texas School Book Depository Building located at the corner of Elm and Houston Streets in Dallas. Yes, sir. What type of work did you do there? Order filler. Order filler of books? Yes, sir. In mid-October of that year, 1963, did a man named Lee Harvey Oswald start to work at the Book Depository Building? Yes, sir. 
And did you learn that Mr. Oswald's Russian-born wife, Marina, was living with a lady named Ruth Payne about half a block from where you lived at 2515 West 5th Street? Yes, sir. Did you learn from Mr. Oswald that he was living by himself in Dallas? Yes, sir, I did. At the beginning of Mr. Oswald's employment at the Book Depository Building in mid-October of 1963, did he ask you if you would drive him to his wife's home in Irving on Friday evenings after work and return with you on Monday morning? Uh, yes, sir, he did. And you agreed to do this? Yes. Driving to and from work, would you and Mr. Oswald talk a lot? Uh, no, sir. Uh, he didn't talk very much. What about at work? Would you see him talk to fellow workers, or would he be pretty pretty much to himself? Uh, he stayed pretty much to himself. He was alone. Okay. Now, Mr. Fraser, was there one time that Mr. Oswald asked you to drive him back to Irving that was not on a Friday? Uh, yes, sir, he did. Was that on November the 21st, 1963, a Thursday? Yes, sir. The day before President Kennedy was assassinated? Yes, sir. And what did you say to him? Uh, he asked me, could you ride home? And I said, sure, you can ride home with me anytime. And then I thought, and I said, well, why do you want to go home with me tonight? And uh, he told me that he was uh, going home to uh, get some curtain rods for his apartment from Miss Payne. Okay, so that evening after work, you brought Mr. Oswald back to Irving, is that correct? That's correct. The following morning, Friday, November the 22nd, 1963, did anything unusual happen while you were eating breakfast? Uh, yes, sir, it did. Uh, Lee looked, uh, had come down to my home, and he looked in the uh, kitchen window. Okay, he hadn't done that before? No, sir. Eventually, you and he got into your car? Yes, sir. When you got into the car, did you notice that he put something in the back seat? Uh, yes, sir. As I was getting in the car, I noticed a package on the uh, back seat. Did you ask him what it was, and if so, what did he say? Uh, yes, sir. I did ask him, and he says, you know, that's the curtain rod that I was going to pick up from Miss Payne. Okay. Once you arrived at the book depository building that morning, where did you park your car? Uh, in the employee parking lot. As I understand it, when the two of you got out of the car, he started walking ahead of you to the entrance of the building. Is that correct? That is correct. As he was walking ahead of you, was he carrying the bag that had been on the back seat? Yes, sir. Did you recall how he was carrying the bag? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he was carrying it uh, parallel to his body. Okay, so he carried the bag right next to his body on the, uh, on the right side? Yes, sir, on the right okay. side. Was it cupped in his hand and under his armpit? I think you've said that in the, in the past. Yes, sir. Mr. Frazier, is it true that you paid hardly any attention to this bag? That is true. So the bag could have been protruding out in front of his body and you wouldn't have been able to see it. Is that correct? That's true. Mr. Frazier, I understand you watched the presidential motorcade from outside the front door of the book depository building. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you heard the rifle shots? Yes, sir. How many did you hear? Three. After the shooting that afternoon, was there a roll call of employees to see if all the employees had returned to the building? Yes, sir, there was. Were all employees present at the time of the roll call or was anyone missing? Uh, everyone was uh, present except Mr. Oswald. He was the only employee who was missing, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. No further questions. Well, Mr. Fraser, do you feel like you've just been at the racetrack? Well, sometimes, yeah, you, you can be there and, you know, it's an yeah. enjoyable experience. So we take our time and see if we can get some facts out here. You and I have never talked together, have we? No, sir. It's the first time you and I have ever met, isn't it? That's correct. You've gone over your testimony in some detail with Mr. Uh, uh, Bugliosi? I've talked with Mr. Pelosi uh, a couple of times, but uh, not in any in depth. Mr. Spence, I know uh, a minute. If you're going to make any address anywhere, Mr. Bugliosi, you will stand on your feet. Uh, Mr. Spence, Most my name is pronounced Bugliosi. The G is silent. I've told you this several times. So mm -hmm. I know it's difficult, but uh, I try to do it, okay? That's the only thing that's silent about Mr. Bugliosi, Your Honor. Please, is, is the jury will disregard that sidebar remark for any purpose at all. Well, all right. Now, you, you, you were trying to, the FBI tried to get you to admit that this package that he was carrying was longer than the package you saw. Isn't that right? Well, I, they had me... Isn't that right, sir? Let him finish his answer, please, counsel. Yes, sir. Well, they had me to make an imaginary bag in my mind. Now, as I say no, previously... Just a minute, let him finish his answer, please. I understand. As I say previously, I only glanced at the package because... The man, he never lied to me, so therefore I never didn't have any doubt to believe what he said was in the package. And you believe that the bag that you saw that he was carrying was one that he could put under his arm and carry in his palm. Isn't that true? Yes, sir, that's true. And, you, and, and that's longer than the rifle would be if it was broken down. Isn't that right? That's correct. Now, you didn't think that Lee was a madman, did you? 
No, sir, he didn't give me that impression. He seemed to you to be a kind of a nice fellow, didn't he? Yes, sir, he was a uh, individual that was nice to children. And he liked his children? Yes, sir, he did. He and when he talked about his children, I think you said, said he chuckled. Yes, he did. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he was concerned about his family and his wife, wasn't he, sir? Yes, he was. And you liked him, didn't you? Yes, sir, I thought he was a very nice person. He always treated me nice. Now, you heard some shots, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. And you thought that uh, those shots came from the direction of the railroad, didn't you? Yes, sir, to nowhere. Now, let's get this kind of figured out, you and me, for the jury. Now, here's the Texas School Book Depository right here, isn't it? Yes, sir, that's correct. And, and you thought the shots came from another direction, didn't you, sir? I thought they came from the no over here. Well, let's could you, let's just get down here. You could just step down a minute and let's take this marker and put an X where you think the pictures were or the shots were. Okay. You can see as we already said, this is Texas School Book Depository, which is at Houston and Elm Street, an old side street here. It ran down here and it was a dead end. But right down in this area here was a no as they call it there. The grassy Knoll. Yes. Just write Grassy Knoll. Okay. Okay, and just put an, and just put an X from the, where you thought the shots were coming from. Okay. You just did that. Thank you. And let's, I don't know what exhibit number this is, but we'll take care of that with the court's counsel's permission a little later. Uh, would you just write your name up there, Mr. Frazier? So we know it was you that put it there. Thank you for your help and your assistance. That's all the questions I have, sir. Mr. Frazier, if you would, please, if you'd step down. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Willie Elsie, if you would, please call your next witness. The government calls Charles Brim. Mr. Brim. Mr. Brim, if you would, please, if you'd come forward. You've already been sworn as a witness, have you not? Yes, I have. All right, fine. Just have a seat over here. Witness box. Yes, sir, please. Can you tell us your name? My name is Charles Brim. Directing your attention, uh, Mr. Brim, to approximately 12.30 p.m. on the date of November the 22nd, 1963, the day of uh, President Kennedy's assassination, were you and your five-year-old son in Dealey Plaza, Dallas, Texas, watching... The motorcade, the presidential motorcade. Yes, we were. You tell the jury what you observed at that time and place. You're in the south side of Elm Street with your son, and tell the jury what you saw and heard at that time. Uh, we we were in approximately this area right here. As the car turned, and, and when I say the car, I mean the, the presidential car, turned and straightened out uh, and started coming down, uh, the first noise that I heard uh, hit the president um, and it struck him and he raised his hand up to his neck. Um, the car proceeded, or it seemed very, very slow, uh, proceeded down just beyond me in this area when the second shot went off, which uh, absolutely destroyed the president's head. The car then took off in, in a uh, uh, zigzag motion down into this area when the third shot, which seemed to me to be a wasted shot, went off, which frightened me more than any of the others because then I thought it was uh, somebody shooting up the place. I then fell on my son. How long would you estimate, Mr. Bram, uh, the interval was between the first and the third shots? First and third shot? Uh, somewhere around seven seconds. Okay. Did you form any opinion as to the location from which the three shots you heard came? Uh, I told the officers that it came from one of the two buildings, one of which uh, was the school book depository, the other one over to that corner, one of the two. You feel very confident about that? Yes, sir, I do. In other words, you feel the, the shots, you believe the shots came from behind the president, is that correct? Absolutely. No further questions.
Mr. Graham, have you ever uh, stated to folks that you feel that you are possibly, uh, that you are a, uh, an expert, an authority on possibly six or eight seconds in history, that you're an absolute expert in that area? I, uh, uh, since I can't lie to you, I'll have to say yes. I do believe I'm an expert on six seconds in history. Now, now, Mr. Brim, I know that you saw what you saw. Have you seen the Zapruder film? I saw it on a quick run through. I have not studied it or any frames. Well, let's look at it together for just a moment. Could, could we have the Zapruder film, the enhanced version uh, at regular speed? There's the sign in front of it. Now the president, he goes forward, grabs his neck. Jackie looks at him, his head goes backwards. Did you see that? Yes. And it looked as if somebody walked right up to the president, if you were going to describe the motion of the president's head when it was hit, walked right up to him with a baseball bat and took a full swing as hard as they could like Babe Ruth and hit him right square in the middle of the forehead and knocked his head back. And that's how it looked, isn't it? Oh, let's look I, at it together. We yeah, these arguments. I, I think your example is might be exaggerated. Well, let's see if it is. Could we watch the president's head, please? Now, this time. Forward, his head. Do you think I exaggerated it, Mr. Oh, Graham? I, I, I can't say. I would draw the question. Now, you've never s seen anybody shot to the head before, have you? No. And you're not a student of biomechanics, are you? No, most certainly not. Were you ever, were you ever a, uh, uh, I know you were a boy once, uh, of course. Did you ever put a can up on the on the fence post and take a rock and hit it? Yes. Uh, if I put a can up here on the fence post and you take a rock, it's got a little water in it. I hope it's water. <laughs> if you put the fence post up there and hit it uh, and, and throw a rock at it, what direction will that Will the can go? Objection on it. Wait, 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 it's irrelevant. It's the, 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 there's no parallel here. A bullet as opposed to a head and a rock and a little piece of uh, paper. Close to wait. I'll overrule your objection at this time. Oh, we don't need to argue about it, do we? I mean, things go accordance with the law of Newton, don't they? No. Oh, wait a while. Is he not, not his his head? Head? That was not attached, sir to that thing, and if you're talking about a head moving in one mode, please attach this with a spring or something when you hit it, and let's see what happens. Okay. Let's take my arm with my fist attached to it. Mm -hmm. See that spot there? Yes. Hit it. Hit it again. That's, that's enough. That'll hurt. That's enough. Oh, listen. Are you <laughs> Let's get off of that. Well, Your Honor, I'm doing the best I can. Yes. Now, how long has it been since you've seen the Zapruder film and studied it as closely as we have with the jury just now before you testified? Years. How many years, sir? Mm, possibly 15. And so, uh, would it be fair to say that uh, the jury has as good a recollection now of those six or eight seconds from having seen the Zapruder film as you? Uh, I would say that the jury has as good a recollection of seeing something purported on film. You question the Zapruder film as being inaccurate? No, I, I question your analysis of it. I see. Thank you. I have no further questions.
Thank you, Mr. Baron. Thank you. It's nice of you to come. Thank you. You might step down. Willie Elsie, if you would, please call your next witness. Government called Harold Norman. Mr. Norman, if you would, please. Mr. Norman. Yes. Mr. Norman. Yes, sir. If you would, please, do come forward. And I believe you were sworn earlier as a witness, were you not? Yes, sir. Just have a seat right up there, please. <coughs> Tell us your name. Harold Norman. Where do you live, Mr. Norman? Dallas, Texas. Thank you. Mr. Norman, uh, in November of 1963, were you working as an order filler for yes. the school books uh, at the Texas School Book Depository Building? Yes, sir. And one of your co-workers was Lee Harvey Oswald, is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Did you become acquainted or friendly with Mr. Oswald at work, Mr. Norman? No, sir. Is there a reason for that? I didn't, he didn't have any, didn't have any conversations at all, so I... He's kind of a loner? Loner. On Friday morning, November the 22nd, 1963, the day President Kennedy was assassinated, did you see the presidential motorcade that day? Yes, sir. Where did you watch it from? From the uh, fifth floor. Did you watch the motorcade with any co-workers? Yes, sir. And what are their names? James Jorman, which is known as Junior, and Marjorie Williams. Exhibit D. Mr. Norman, on your left is a photograph of four windows, three of which are open, and as you can see, there are two men in the bottom windows. Do you recognize who is shown in this photograph? Yes, sir. And who is shown? This is uh, Marty Ray Williams, and that is myself, Harold Norman. So you were in the southeasternmost window of the fifth floor of the book depository building? Yes, sir. And then eventually the presidential motorcade passed by, is that correct? Yes, sir. What did you see and hear at that time, Mr. Norman? Well, I heard a shot when the uh, motorcade came by. The first shot, and that president slumped, then I heard two more shots. So you heard a total three shots? Yes, sir. Did it sound to you like a rifle was being fired directly above you? Yes, sir. Was there any other reason, in addition to the sound of the rifle, any other reason why you believe the shots were coming from directly above you? Yes, sir. What is that? Because I could hear the uh, empty hulls, that's what I call them, hit the floor, and I could hear the uh, bolt action of the rifle being pushed back and forward. You're familiar with a bolt action rifle? Yes, sir. By hulls, you mean uh, cartridge cases? Cartridge. How many did you hear falling to the floor? Three. Is the sound of that bolt action and the ejection of the cartridge casings and they're falling to the floor something that you're going to remember for the rest of your life? Yes, sir. Sure. Incidentally, just, excuse me, just, Your Honor, I haven't really made any objection about leading questions because I generally don't do that in a trial, but it would be nice if counsel wouldn't lead him, particularly like the last one, giving him, a, a leading him into posterity, even, e even into eternity. I'm going to overrule the objection at this time. One more question. At any time in the morning of the assassination, did you see any stranger or strangers in the book depository building? No, sir. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Mr. Spence, you may proceed, sir. Mr. Norman, <clears throat> give us the the rhythm of the sounds of these shots. Was it bam, 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 or what was it? As I recall, the rhythm of the sounds of shots were boom, click, click, boom, click, click, boom, click, click. Just all even. Just a even. Now, you, you said that you heard uh, uh, some hulls drop. Yes, sir. If it, after it was all over, somebody had come around and said, we found uh, three nails, big nails, or three big screws, or something of that nature, the sounds that you heard would have, of, of the things hitting the floor, would have been consistent, would have sounded like about anything metal dropping isn't that true i can't say i mean have you ever heard you never had heard metal cases from a from a gun drop over your head before had you i told you what it sounded like to me yes yes sir okay um when was the last time before the assassination that you'd ever heard a rifle eject a shell i can't say that that time sir. never had heard one had you yes sir i've heard some uh well you try
tried to get you to say the FBI in this case that that you heard the shots from the from right above you, but you didn't say that, did you? You didn't say you heard the shots right above you, did you? No, I said I heard the shot above me. I didn't say it directly. I just want to say I said the shot above. Me. Yeah, they were trying to get you to say something different, weren't they? Yes, sir. And you resisted, didn't you? You didn't want to have words put in your mouth, no, did you? Sir. And you don't want me or anybody else to put them in your yes, mouth sir. in this hearing, isn't that true? Yes, sir. Now, <clears throat> you thought there was an armed man upstairs, right? I thought there was a man upstairs. Well, you must have figured he was armed because you were hearing shooting and shells falling all over the place, isn't that true? I heard three, sir. So, you, let's see if we can start again. You thought there was an armed man up there, isn't that right? I can't see. I thought. Didn't you think there was somebody up there I with a gun? I thought there was somebody up there, sir. With a gun. All right. You didn't run and get the hell out of there? No, sir. You never did call down for the police? <laughs> no, sir. You stayed up there for 15 minutes just watching the crowd after that. Isn't that true? I can't see exactly what time it was, sir. You stayed up there for quite some time watching the crowd afterwards. Isn't that true, sir? I stayed there for a while. Yes. And uh, you left about 2 o'clock? Yes, sir. So everybody was absent, isn't that true? Uh, after we after they let us go home, everyone was absent. Yeah, everybody finally left the building. With the uh, permission of the officers? Yes. That would include my client, Mr. Oswald, isn't that I true? don't know, sir. He wasn't there either, was he? I never did see him anymore, sir. Yes. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, fine. Thank you. Call your next witness. Governor calls Eugene Boone. Mr. Boone, if you would, please. You come forward. You've been sworn, have you not? Yes, sir. Thank you. Just have a seat right there. Tell us your name. Eugene Boone. Where do you live, Mr. Boone? Abilene, Texas. In 1963, Mr. Boone, were you a deputy sheriff of the county of Dallas? Yes, sir, I was. And at approximately 12.30 p.m. on the date, November the 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination, do you recall where you were? Yes, sir. And where was that? In front of the sheriff's office at 505 Main Street. Did you hear any shots around that time? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, would you please show the jury where you were at the time you heard the shots, where you ran to, and uh, what you did when you arrived at that area. Generally, I was in this area right here. I ran down Main Street and around this cement works across this grassy area here, and then eventually over this uh, the fence and the cement wall embutment here into the freight yards. This is the famous grassy knoll area right here? Yes, sir. Can the jury see this? Did you find any evidence at all uh, of a gunman having been in that area right there? No, sir. I'm talking about the grassy knoll area and the, uh, the railroad yard area behind the grassy knoll area. No, sir. As I recall, there were uh, cars parked in this area right here. This area here, there was a flower bed uh, in the in this area here. I did examine the flower bed and the foliage uh, in this area and down this area here, and could see no footprints in the flower beds that had recently been turned, or was there any indication of any powder burns, anything like that, on any of the foliage that we could see. Can you mean resume the witness stand? you search the area about which you've just been testifying to, Mr. Boone, I understand you went to the sixth floor of the book depository building and searched that floor with other law enforcement officers, is that correct? Yes, sir. Exhibit number 11. Now on the screen is a photograph, Mr. Boone, of stacks of cartons or boxes near a window. Do you recognize what is depicted in uh, this photograph? The boxes on the inside of the southeast building, uh, the southeast uh, floor of the sixth floor of the school book depository, the southeast corner. When you arrived on the sixth floor, is this the way the cartons were stacked around that window? Yes, sir. So there, you could almost say there was a sniper's nest around that window? Yes, sir. 
How long after the, uh, the shots that you heard did you arrive? Excuse me. Well, it seems to me, Your Honor, that uh, this man has been leaving all morning, over and over again, even to the point that he had one witness led into what he would remember forever. And I object to that. Now, I just want the record to show that I object to that. And if you want me not to make any further objections on that kind, I'd like the record to reveal that you've instructed me not to do that, not to make any more such objections, and I'll not make any. But I want you to know that I do object to the continuous leading questions of counsel. Mr. Spence, keep on your feet, Mr. Spence, if you would, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Spence, my ruling is you can make any objection that you want to. Don't ever tell the court that you're just standing up and you know that it is a waste of time because you don't get any of them. I don't just decide, except on the basis of the law as I feel it is, whether your objection is good or whether it's bad. As to what it looked like, I sustain it as to what it looked like. You can make your description on that part only. Thank you, sir. You may be seated. Now, may I have a ruling on my objection, please? Yes, sir. I sustained as to what it looked like, as to the sniper's pit. May I, have a, may I have a ruling on whether or not it was leading? It was leading. Thank yes, you, Your Honor. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Leo. What do those cartons and boxes look like to you? It looked like an attempt to hide something on the other side. If someone had been walking on that sixth floor and someone was behind those boxes, uh, could the person behind the boxes have been seen? They would be concealed from either the elevator or the stairwell across the building. Exhibit 12. Next on the screen is another photograph. Do you recognize what is depicted in this photograph? Yes, sir. It's the area between the row of boxes on the previous exhibit and the window. Looks like a, a place where a rifle could rest. Those boxes look like a gun rest? Yes, sir, as I remember them. Did you eventually spot a rifle on the sixth floor, Mr. Boone? Yes, sir, I did. Exhibit 14, do you recognize what's depicted in this photograph? Yes, sir. The rifle. The rifle that you saw on the sixth floor? Yes, sir. Is that the way the rifle looked when you found it? Yes, sir. When you first looked at the weapon, Mr. Boone, did you mistakenly take it for a 7.65 millimeter Mauser? Yes, sir. And why did you think it was a Mauser? A well, Mauser basically refers to a bolt action, and there were a lot of military weapons around at that point in time. Is Ma Mauser kind of a generic term for a bolt action rifle? Yes, sir. You are not an expert on firearms. I am not. Thank you, Mr. Boone. No further questions. Mr. Spence? Thank you. Thank you. Well, how are you doing, Mr. Boone? Very well, thank you, sir. I, um, I want you to help me make some sense out of some of this, if you would. You were the one that found this gun, is that right? Yes, sir. I mean, not to belittle you in any way, well, you just happened to be there, but anybody could have found that gun, couldn't they? If they were looking in the right direction, yes. I mean, anybody that went up on the sixth floor looking for something would have had to been blind not to see it. Isn't that right, sir? No, sir. I mean, there it is. That's the way you saw it. Isn't that yes, true? Sir. And so, do you think that that's uh, the way somebody who really was trying to hide a gun would hide a gun? Or do you think, Lieutenant, that that's where a gun would be left by somebody who wanted a gun to be found? I'm sorry? I mean, they took enough time to create a so-called sniper's den of boxes, didn't they? Yes, sir. Don't you think they would have taken sufficient time, unless they wanted the gun to be found, to find a place to hide the gun where you just couldn't walk right up and see it. For example, right in there. Well, all right. Now about the shells. You found shells up there, didn't you? Uh, Officer Luke Mooney found some cartridge cases. Three cartridge cases, weren't there? Yes, sir. Right out in plain sight, in front of anybody that wanted to see them, right in the so-called sniper's den. Isn't that true? Behind the boxes, yes, sir. And uh, don't you think that anybody 
Who is attempting to perform an assassination? Who would indeed set up a sniper's den? Would have taken the time to pick up three cartridges so they couldn't be connected with his rifle? Doesn't that seem reasonable? Or do you think, officer, or did you consider the possibility that the three cartridge cases were left there, like the rifle, so that they could be found? Did you give that some thought? No, sir. Could we have Exhibit 13, please? Now, Exhibit 13 shows us the so-called sniper's den, doesn't it, officer? Yes, sir. And it's the circles are around where those shell cartridges were plainly found. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. And isn't it true that a rifle of the kind involved in this case? May I, Your Honor? Are you sure it's unloaded? You may Absolutely. Sure. I've, uh, I've looked in this both directions. Thank you. Um, isn't it true, officer, that a rifle of this kind ejects the shell to the right? Yes, sir, generally. Well, generally or doesn't it always eject the shell to the right? Have you ever seen a rifle of this type eject the shell to the left? Let's see the weapon. They should eject it to the right, to the Not to generally, the right, but right. in every case. Isn't that true, officer? Yes, sir. But in the case in point, Part of the shells were ejected to the right and part to the left. Isn't that true? That's uh, the way it appears there. Does that stand up to, in accordance with your idea about where cartridges would have naturally come from the rifle as the party shot out the window? Or does it more properly match a situation where somebody threw cartridges to be found? I don't know. Now, Mauser, you know, is a considered to be a much better gun than a Mannlicher in a general sense. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. That is, it shoots better and it shoots faster, doesn't it? Well, it shoots better. It's more accurate weapon. And a Mannlicher, Italian Mannlicher, on the other hand, like the one involved in this case, is actually considered by those who are experts in firearms as a piece of junk. Isn't that true? I would think so. Thank you. That piece of junk that we just looked at cost about $21. Isn't that right, sir? I really don't know, sir. And uh, so far as you're concerned at the time, that gun that you saw in the stacks was a mouse, isn't that right? At that, point, at that point in time, yes, sir. And it wasn't until after a certain gun in the possession of the FBI suddenly turned out to be a manlicker that it changed from being a mauser to a manlicker, isn't that true? I would say that's accurate statement. Yeah, yes, thank sir. you. And isn't it true? that you, Officer Boone, were never later able to identify the rifle that you found at the Texas School Book Depository as the one that was later shown to you as being the gun involved in this assassination. Isn't that true? That's correct. Now, you say you went to the railroads and did some searching there? Yes, sir. And uh, you went to the Grassy Knoll? Yes, sir. And uh, you went there because there were many, many people told you that they heard shots from that direction. Isn't that right? There were several people, yes, sir. And you knew that a lot of people ran in that direction, didn't you? No, sir. Do you have, could we have the clip, please, of the film? The Hughes film?
You see people running toward the grassy knoll, sir? Yes. There were scores of them, were there not? Yes, running in the direction of the grassy knoll, that's correct. Also in the direction of the, the assassination scene. Now, you said you checked the area of the grassy knoll for powder birds? Yeah, we checked the foliage, yes, sir. For in powder fire, birds? For powder, powder birds. birds? How did yes, you check sir. it? Visually? Yes, sir. Well, did you find any? No, sir. Do you think you would have been able to recognize powder birds in the foliage if you had seen it? I believe so, sir. Did you find any powder birds up on the sixth floor of the Texas Book Depository? I did not. Did you know of anybody in the history of the world who found any powder birds up there? Not to my knowledge, no, thank sir. Thank you, sir. Judge, thank you very much. Thank you, officer. I appreciate your testimony. Yes, I have no further questions. Thank you. Redirect. Very briefly, now. Mr. Boone, did the FBI ever show you a rifle which they said was a rifle found on the sixth floor? Yes, sir. And what did you say when you looked at that rifle? It appears to be the rifle that I saw on the sixth floor of the school book. Well, didn't you just tell Mr. Spence that uh, you could not identify it? I could not identify it positively because I did not have an identifying mark on the weapon. Okay, but it appeared to be the same It way. appeared to be the same That's one. Answer. Thank you. No further questions. Did it appear to be a man liquor? Yes, sir. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you very much, Mr. Boone. Call your next witness. Yeah. Um, Marion Baker. Baker, if you would, please, you come forward. You were sworn earlier as a witness, were you not, sir? Yes, sir, I was. Fine, thank you. Just have a seat right over here. Tell us your name, please. Marion L. Baker. Directing your attention to the date, November the 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination, were you a police officer at the Dallas Police Department? Yes, sir, I was. Were you assigned to ride a motorcycle in the presidential motorcade that day? Yes, sir. The presidential limousine eventually turned left on Elm from Houston Street? Yes, sir, it did. What's the next thing that happened? At this time, I heard three shots. Exhibit F. With the pointer, would you please show the jury on the diagram approximately where you were on Houston Street when you heard these three shots? Okay, about this area right here. All right, you heard three shots at that point. Do you have any sense as to where these shots were fired from? Approximately this building here. The book depository building? Yes, sir. After you heard these three shots, what's the next thing that you did? I rode my motorcycle to the northwest corner, right about here. All right. And parked it and ran inside. All right. Exhibit H, Mr. Baker. Now on the, uh, on the easel, Mr. Baker, the floor plan is reportedly the second floor of the book depository building. Do you recognize this floor plan as being the second floor? Yes, I do. With your pointer, would you indicate to the jury what happened when you reached the second floor landing? Right here, on the second floor landing, as I came out of the stairways, there was a door facing me. And through this window in the door, I saw a movement. And then I went over and opened the door, and I saw this man walking away from me. What did you say to him, if anything? I called to him, and... Uh, said, uh, come here. He turned around and started walking back towards me. Okay. Was Mr. Truly at your side? Yes, sir. Mr. Truly was at my side. That's the superintendent of the building? Yes, sir, it is. Did you ask him who the man was? Yes, sir, it is. He told you it was Lee Oswald? Yes, sir. Did he appear out of breath? No, sir. Do you recall how he was dressed? No, sir. Mr. Baker, other than Lee Harvey Oswald, did you see anyone else at all on the second floor? No, sir. You may sit down, sir. Mr. Baker, as I understand it, at a later time, March the 20th, 1964, you timed how long it would have taken Mr. Oswald, if he had fired the shots from the southeasternmost window of the sixth floor, to have gotten down to the second floor lunch room where you confronted him. Is that correct? That's correct. So you determined that Oswald would have had enough time to get to where you confronted him. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Baker. No further questions. Mr. Spence? Thanks, Mr. Baker. Um, let me see exhibit 
the photo of the man in the door. Can you show me that one? See the man in that picture? Yes, sir. You know who that is? No, sir, I don't. Have we got a blow-up of that, please? 21A. See the man in the doorway? Yes, sir. Do you know who that man is? No, sir. Look like anybody you ever saw before? Resembles Oswald, but I'm not, I don't know him. Do you know whether or not that wasn't taken at the time of the shooting? No, sir, I don't. Let's go back again, look back from that photo before, and see if we can't see the presidential limousine in the foreground. I won't ask, I won't belabor it any further. Let me ask you another question. When you got to the Texas bookstore, Lee was in the um, lunchroom, wasn't he? Yes, sir. And, uh, and may I have exhibit uh, uh, 20A. Was he inside the room that we're looking at now? Yes, sir. He wasn't running? No, sir. But did he seem excited? No, sir. Seem nervous? No, sir. Well, a man who is neither excited nor nervous nor panting is not exactly acting in a way you would expect somebody who had just seconds before killed the President of the United States no, by shooting him three times with a man liquor rifle is it that final true? summation now or is this cross-examination just, just a minute if you will yeah i object uh, it's final summation he's not having to say it during his final summation now well that's well, what he's been doing in cross-examination can you answer the question yes or no <clears throat> remember the question sir we yeah. take yeah. Like a band we just shot the president no, it was a lot quicker thank, no, sir. thank you very much uh mr baker for coming no further questions Thank you. You may step down. Thank you very much, Mr. Baker. Call your next witness. The government called Ted Calloway. If you would, please, sir, if you'd come forward. Mr. Calloway. Mr. Calloway, if you would, please, if you'd come forward. Have a seat right over here in the witness chair, if you would, please, sir. Have a seat there, please. Tell us your name. My name is Ted Calloway. Thank you. Mr. Calloway, your present occupation, sir? I'm a used car dealer. Okay. Directing your attention back to the date, November the 22nd, 1963, the date President Kennedy was assassinated. Were you employed as the used car manager at Harris Brothers Auto Sales, located at 501 East Jefferson Boulevard in Dallas? That's correct. Around 1.15 p.m. on that date, will you tell the jury where you were and what you heard at that time? I was standing on the front porch of our office, and when I heard what sounded like five pistol shots. Okay, could you pick up the pointer there by your right hand and uh, indicate on the diagram where you were when you heard the shots and where the shots appeared to be coming from? I was right here on this porch. All right. And the shots sounded like they were coming in this direction on 10th Street. Okay. Now, when you heard these shots, uh, what did you do at that point? I ran out to the sidewalk on Patton Street. Okay. Will you use your pointer to point out the locations involved? Yes, I just ran from here out to the sidewalk. Okay. Again, with the pointer, would you tell the jury what you observed at that point? I saw a man running from this front yard on 10th Street across the street, which would be the west side of Patton. Did he have anything in either of his hands? Yes, yeah, sir. He had a pistol in his right hand. Okay. How was he carrying the uh, pistol? He was carrying it in a raised pistol position. Would you demonstrate that to the jury? Like this. Did he run past you where you were? No. He ran toward me, I was right. on the east side, he was on the west side of Patton. What's the closest you came to? The FBI measured it at about 56 feet. Okay. And, uh, Did you get a good, clear view of him? Very good view. Did you talk to him at all? Yes, sir. What did you say to him? What did you say to you, if anything? I hollered at him. I said, hey, man, what the hell's going on? And he slowed 
almost to a halt. Turned in my direction, still had his pistol in his direction. He said something to me, which I couldn't understand it. Then he proceeded to run toward Jefferson through this front yard right here and proceed west on 10th on Jefferson Street. Let's take a look at the photo of Oswald. Looking at Lee Harvey Oswald, is he or is he not the man that you saw that day? That's the man, yes, sir. Any question in your mind about that, sir? None whatsoever. Okay, you may sit down here. After the man ran past you, after Oswald ran past you, then what did you do, sir? That's when I ran toward the corner of 10th and Patton and to see what was going on, and that's where I saw the police squad car and Officer Tippett lying in front of the squad car. Did he appear to be dead at that time? He did. And what did you do? I leaned over and felt his pulse at his throat. Then I got on, uh, I found old pulse, and I got on the police radio and told them that Officer had been killed. They told me, yes, they'd already heard about it to stay off the air. Mr. Callaway, on the night of the Tippett murder, did you go to a lineup at the Dallas Police Department around 6.30 p.m.? Yes, sir, I did. How many men were in the lineup? Four. Were all four men of the uh, approximate same age, height, and weight? They were. What happened when the four men stepped out in front of you? Well, I recognized Oswald right away as a man that I'd seen running uh, down Patton. Thank you. No further questions. Vince? Now, Mr. Calloway, um, you did perform an, a, a lineup, isn't that true? Went to the police line? They did a lineup, didn't they? Right. And before they put you, let you identify this, do you think they were being totally fair and open about it? They sure were. I mean, they didn't give you any hints of any kind, did they? No, sir. I mean, they didn't say anything to you that would lead you to believe that the man that uh, that you saw was the man who was supposedly killed the president, did they? No, sir. They didn't I can say tell you exactly you. what they said. They didn't wait say... Wait a while, wait a while. He had something to say, Mr. Stewart. Yes, yes, he answered it. Oh, he answered the question. Let me know over, Mr. Yossi. He didn't say to you, quote, the officer didn't say to you, quote, we want to be sure we want to try to wrap him up real tight on killing this officer. 